My guest today is Peter Bardenfleth Hansen. Peter is the CEO of Zaptec, a company based out of Norway that builds electric vehicle charging systems. As electric cars become more and more widely adopted, the infrastructure to support charging of these cars and to manage the demands this places on the electricity grid will have to ramp up significantly compared to where it is today. We dive into this today. We'll also talk about the different types of EV chargers, the key decision makers in adopting these systems, and the learnings Peter took from Tesla to help shape Zaptec into the company that it has become today. Zaptec as a company was founded in 2012 and went public in 2020. With 10 years of experience in e-mobility, first at Tesla and more recently as a board member or advisor of multiple e-mobility companies in the Nordics, Peter brings unique insights to this fast-changing ecosystem so critical to the energy transition. I hope you enjoy my discussion with Peter. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Nathan Pomart and this is Loose, the Climate Tech Podcast. Every week, we interview a founder and explore the stories, ideas, innovations, and businesses behind some of the most inspiring climate tech companies that have a tangible, positive impact on our planet. This show is designed to help you learn, instigate optimism, and inspire further action towards addressing the climate change challenge that we face as a global community. If you are an entrepreneur, business leader, or investor interested in learning more about the climate tech space and how you can play a part in it, this show is for you. So, so Peter, um, very glad to have you on the show. We were chatting uh, before before starting the recording about the extensive experience that you have with uh, the mobility value chain and the electrification of it which is, you know, such a prominent topic in the, in the climate tech uh, universe. I'm very happy to have you. I'm, I'm very uh, excited to get going. And uh, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Nate. I'm very keen to hear the backstory around how you ended up with Zaptec. You spent 10 years at, at Tesla, uh, helping Tesla break into the Norwegian market before that, and surely you observed a lot during that time that you then used as insights, perhaps to to decide what to do next. So, would love to understand what what has been your journey. Well, I guess my my journey very much um, started in in this at the in the beginning, perhaps the end of of the of the financial crisis in the zeros, where I'd been working as a as a founder as a as a entrepreneur within a completely different industry. I was, I was working in the um, restaurant business and uh, it wasn't really bringing much value. I'm not talking about monetary value. I'm thinking about more the, the, the more deeper sense of, of value and certainly not helping any, anybody else other than myself. And, and at the end of the day, being at the end of a, of a financial crisis, uh, even that part wasn't even uh, being very uh, helpful, <laughs> if you like. And I, I took a, a very deep look at myself and decided, you know what, I have to do something different about my life and something different about my focus. I want to make this place a better place for my for my children, uh, and definitely have a different legacy than than just having a couple of restaurants to my name. So yes. I decided to get out of that business uh, all completely and uh, made a very clear decision. I remember the day I said to my to my girlfriend, I said, "Listen, I am going to go into e-mobility," uh, and and she was like, "E-mobility, what what's that?" And anybody I mentioned this to was like we don't understand. And, and basically I focused a lot on that. I did as much nerding as I could in the, in the topic and um, came across uh, a small startup called Tesla. And with a colleague of mine, uh, we managed to get a connection directly to Elon Musk. We had a, a conversation with him. My, my colleague, he's a, he's a journalist, did a written piece and basically started working on a sort of freelance basis for, for Elon. And this was leading up to exactly COP15, which was held here in Copenhagen and me being Danish, um, it made a lot of sense that uh, I could help out in any way given to um, try and promote electrical cars, 
which was still yes. completely unknown. Basically, uh, my colleague and myself were given all the Teslas in Europe, which was three, I think, <laughs> four, I don't remember. Uh, and and uh, we, we did a promotional piece on, on Tesla. And uh, although the COP15 wasn't a great political success, it definitely helped put Copenhagen on a map of, of being a social responsible city. And basically, mm -hmm. uh, on the back of that, Elon Musk said, listen, guys, I want you to open up a, um, a, a Scandinavian headquarters. And uh, by June 2010, we opened the first door and, and I was hired as the first full-time employee of Tesla in, in, in Northern Europe. And basically, that's how my journey in this field started. And quickly, I learned that um, Norway was, was the place to be. And, uh, and I, we had one car, which was a you know, small roadster. It was the showroom car. It was the test drive car. And it was also the car that you would use for all of Scandinavia. And Scandinavia in population is very small, but in distances is enormous. Um, sure. So I had to sort of carry this this one car around uh, all of Scandinavia to promote and, and basically quickly found out that Norway definitely was the place with the best incentives and started the, um, the, the journey from there. And, and then it was just, the rest is history uh, for all intents yes. and purposes. And the reason Norway was, was the, the best place to be was because of regulations and government incentives? Most definitely. I mean, um, there, is a, there is an interesting duality with Norway because Norway is, is an oil-producing nation. Their wealth comes almost uh, 100% from, from, from oil in the North, Northern Sea. And, um, of course, there, there may be a moral um, aspect of this that they have felt that they needed to give back uh, in one right. way or another. And so there was a lot of focus on ensuring that uh, e-mobility had all the possible incentives that you could give it. There was no taxes, no VAT. You could drive in the bus lanes. Um, electricity for uh, e-charging was free. You could take ferries for free. You could drive in the city rings for free. Basically, anything you could do uh, that cost money in a normal car was free if you had an electric car. And of course, that in itself was a was very much uh, playing into the hands of, of the idea of low hanging fruits. So there we were. Of course, I think the incentives were given because, uh, you know, on average, there was maybe sold a couple of hundreds of these vehicles a year. And it didn't mean anything uh, in relation sure. to giving these incentives. But of course, then I came along <laughs> uh, with, with Tesla. Uh, and of course, that changed the whole playing field, if you like, because what we naturally did was was uh, to show that there was a, a viable alternative to combustion engine vehicles. Yes. Um, and that in itself was an eye opener, not just for the Norwegians, but, but for the rest of the Scandinavian countries, of course, the rest of European countries. And even, even Tesla self and, and Elon uh, himself used the fact that we were so successful in Norway as a both a sort of stamp of approval, um, but also to show the world that, um, that there was no limitations for e-mobility. People have been saying, well, you know, you did a you did a Tesla Roadster, you have ideas for for a bigger sedan, which became the Model S. However, it's all conceptualized and built in California. That's not the real world. E-mobility is something that just uh, works in sunshine and when you drive downhill and the wind is right. Um, all of those aspects, we completely contradicted and showed that this was uh, BS, <laughs> that e-mobility was something that was usable in all different kinds of places and uh, where better to showcase that than in Norway which uh, actually has a large part of its geography uh, to the north of the Arctic Circle. So of course all of those aspects uh, were used uh, by, by Elon Musk in, in, in promoting Tesla. And of course, we were promoting as much as we could in, in, uh, in the Nordics. So not just uh, Denmark and Norway, of course, also Sweden, Finland um, and, and Iceland. And later on, 
many other places in in Scandinavia, in, in Northern Europe, and and all the way out to Japan. I worked as well as, as setting up uh, the Middle East. So another lion's den, if you like, if you look at yes. uh, fossil fuel vehicles and fossil fuel um, in general. So yeah, it was quite a journey. I um, I was there for a good tenure of almost ten years, from the early starts of of oh uh, nine to um, to nineteen. So. Um, yeah. So P Peter, I I um I don't want to ask you to spend too much more time on, on on the Tesla story, and you know part of my my vision for this podcast is of course when they will get Elon Musk on the show, and uh, and 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 he, and he will fill in the gaps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although you know we we don't smoke weed here typically, um, and so I want to move on to to asking you about Zaptac and about basically you know. Now that you compare to 10 years ago, so if electric cars feel much more like this is actually going to happen. Uh, 10 yeah. years ago was, you know, do, who, who the hell are you? Like you're completely crazy. And now things have changed so much. So that's incredible in its own right. And now you have to build all this infrastructure to support this new mobility model. And that's where Zaptec and also some of the other companies you're involved in uh, come in. So could you help us understand what Zaptec does and where it fits in? Yeah. So um, the story of Zaptec, although I'm not uh, a founder of the company, I do I do tell myself that I'm part a small part of the start of the company in, in, in one way or another um, because of the the fact that I, I joined uh, the the board of directors in 2020, but the company was actually concepted in, in 2012 as a as a sort of more tech company in Stavanger in Norway, which again is the oil capital of Norway, thereby being oil capital of Northern Europe. The the um, the reason why I got the board position in 2020 was due to the fact that I'd done a uh, promotion or a a talk on e-mobility, on infrastructure in 2012 or 2013. So just after basically the company had been conceptualized, um, Saptech. And then basically they took a clear decision in 2017 and all the tech parts that they'd been working on, they focused on just doing charging. Now this was for me, of course, a an obvious thing to do in Tesla, we initially thought that this wasn't going to be a, an issue, mm -hmm. but come 2011, 2012, it became obvious that there was a, a range anxiety thing going on in the market. Yes. People were worrying about the fact that where and how am I going to drive? It's all very well if you can charge a little bit at home, but what, what if, if I want to go to visit somebody who's further away than than uh, 200 miles or whatever, or two or 300 kilometers. And basically that whole thing started and the whole discussion on what comes first to chicken on the egg, i.e. the infrastructure or the, or the actual e-mobility, the, 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 the EV, yeah. electrical vehicle. And so uh, for companies such as Saptec, of course, there was a, an open opportunity here to start being part of that solution the solution of ensuring that you make an infrastructure that's big enough, that's wide enough to be able to ensure a quick transition towards e-mobility. Because that's basically, at the end of the day, what, what's required in order to do a transition towards e-mobility and thereby uh, cutting out carbon um, that comes as, as a result of, of combustion engine vehicles. And of course, Saptec um, is, along with other companies out there, a company that's focused on making uh, hardware for uh, charging e-mobility. So whether it be a electric car, or whether it be electric motorbike, or for that matter, an electric boat, Saptec can can charge that. To to illustrate this for for myself and for others who who are not into the the de details of this. So Zaptec makes, makes the, the hardware that we see at an EV charging station. Is that correct? Yeah. And what, do, what does that hardware do kind of what, what does it convert? I guess it, it converts something into something else that the car can use to recharge its battery. So what is the, yeah. what is the technology that, that is sitting there? 
So let, let's do a, a very quick <clears throat> 101. I'm obviously not going to spend uh, all day on, uh, going through all the uh, the nerdy parts here, but the, the, the quick 101 on, on, on charging is that there are two types of charging. There is AC and there's DC. AC yeah. charging is basically um, alternating current. It's the slowest type of charging, but it's also the charging that's most available anywhere. AC is what's available in any any given home, basically anywhere in the world uh, that has electricity. And DC, on the other hand, is, is direct current. And basically the technology and the type of electricity that you use for storage, for instance, in batteries, e-mobility yeah. batteries, lithium ion batteries are DC. In order for the one does not necessarily eliminate the other, but you need to convert if you want to use the one way or the other way. So uh, for instance, um, all superchargers, these very fast chargers that people may or may not be available in the, in the C in markets are DC chargers. They're very right. quick at charging batteries, but they're also extremely costly. They're costly to make and they're costly uh, to to set up. And basically what's great and what's very quick with these is that it's DC electricity that comes out of these chargers and it's DC that's in the battery. So you're not circumnavigating, you're going directly from the charger directly into the battery. So that's a win-win. Then you have what's called AC charging, which is the most available and by far the cheapest type of charging. Um, but here you have to convert AC into DC. Saptic has probably the, some of the best AC chargers in the world. So that's basically where we have focused our attention is in the AC world, if you like. And we Got do it. this because we believe, not that we disbelieve anything to do with DC in, in, by any means, but I would say DC is very much enabling long distance driving or, or quick driving if you like, because you, you, can, you can use it for, for quick charging. Whereas AC is generally something you would use when your vehicle, whether it be a car or a, a two-wheeler or anything else, uh, is stationary for, let's say, more than a couple of hours. So typically, over, overnight charging would be a perfect typically, use case for AC. Definitely. I would say up Anything above an hour uh, makes Got sense with an, okay. with, with an AC charger, but, but basically correct. What is amazing there is that, uh, as I alluded earlier, this is something that can help ensure that bigger and larger parts of society can be electrified and thereby ensure that the availability of charging infrastructure is not just limited to those single supercharged sites that there may be out in the world. The problem, again, with the supercharged site is one supercharger. Now I'm using supercharger because that's the word Tesla uses. Let's just call it fast charger. Yeah. It will easily cost for the hardware and the installation easily cost 200,000 euros per site, per, per singular outlet. And how does that compare to a to an AC charger, for example? Well, if there is electricity there already, then we're talking perhaps five or six, eight hundred euros. Okay, so it's it's like twenty times more expensive, forty twenty yeah. to forty and, times more expensive. And wh and yeah, why exactly. is why is that? If we kind of just nerd out for one more question, why is it so much more expensive? Well, basically, if you have DC charging, um, firstly, the, the, uh, the technology and the hardware is more costly, but that's not where the, the biggest issue is, but, but it, is, it is definitely more costly. There are more uh, elements in there because of the electricity that's being used. It is being, um, it's basically being on a, on a constant high voltage, mm -hmm. um, which produces a lot of heat for uh, amongst other things you need very thick cabling and also specifically in the installation is is very very costly because you cannot and most locations don't have a, a dc charge um, available at let's say in a building or yes. a because you need to to basically convert 
And if you're converting, then it doesn't make any sense. So basically you need to put down cabling to put up DC chargers. Um, okay. And that's, that's very, very costly. Uh, whereas AC is, is a much cheaper technology. It's, it's for all intensive purposes, just a plug. People in my own organization will hit me in the head for saying that. But at the end of the day, that's, that's what, it, what it is. But then, of course, there are elements to this that you can add, which is what we do. For instance, making it a smart charger. And that's very, very important. It is, and I'll come to that in a moment because that's what actually makes AEC chargers and specifically those from SAPTEC something that becomes a part of a social responsible plan in uh, providing um, infrastructure out in not just for the private individuals, but also being part of a bigger solution in a whole region or a market or, for instance, a whole uh, continent like the European one. And so here you mean smart charging in the sense of deciding at which time to draw from the network to optimize for either cost or CO2 emissions. For instance, but there's more to smart charging than that, because you're, you're completely right that that's definitely one part, which is a, a, an important one, specifically in these days where uh, electricity um, is fluctuating at very, very high costs. So yeah. just the mere ability to be able to concentrate uh, on charging in the times when it's actually cheap or cheaper uh, obviously makes a lot of sense. But there are more elements to this. The, the, the grid, the flow of electricity uh, obviously is, is something that is extremely important. I think we in the Western world uh, have just been become very complacent to the fact that, oh, you just plug something into the, into, into the plug and you have electricity. And you don't really think about where it's coming from. Yeah. Perhaps you're, you're aware that this is a coal industry. You may be lucky like we are in Denmark, where most of it's coming from, from wind industry these days, or it may be coming from uh, nuclear fusion, which is another, you know, these are various uh, suppliers of, of electricity, but you may not. Most people are not. They're just happy that there is electricity flow in their, in their plug. And of course, being able to ensure that flow is very important. It, it, it's like a river. Electricity is not just something that that there is ample of. Uh, you know, there there is it's it, there is a finite an amount of of electricity, all yeah. depending on how much you produce. It's just like producing. Um, uh, it's like water flowing in the river. So if you if you take some of that water, there'll be a little bit less. And if you have a lot of takers, there'll be a, at the end of the day, it will be empty. And so what you need to do, of course, is to find a solution where you don't empty the river. And at some point, everybody is going to be using the water from the river, not just for the washing machines and their hair dryers and uh, their ovens and everything else, but also now to, to charge their cars, which is an enormous consumer of electricity. Yeah. Sure. Um, and if everybody comes home from, from work or wherever at six o'clock and they all plug in their cars, you are going to empty that river. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's the problem. So being able to uh, solve this on a, on a sort of larger scale is, is very important, but you can only do that if you have the ability to control the chargers that are ensuring the charge to the vehicles. So if you have the ability to turn these chargers off or reduce charge at a given time, it needn't be for hours and hours, perhaps just a couple of minutes, perhaps just a couple of seconds, you can ensure that that flow in the river continues while still charging, but you reduce it and you up it and you lower it just as you want. And in some cases, and this is where the this is where where the technology is going, you do what we call vehicle to grid or vehicle to X, i.e. the you other can way. Actually, take the AC and go the other way because now the, the 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 river is empty. What do we do? Well, we now have two million cars plugged into the charge net here. Perhaps we can borrow a, a little bit of electricity and fill up some of the missing parts in the river. And, and that is an important part. Again, you can only do this with smart chargers, yes. not quote unquote smart chargers. Is your vision as well that uh, you can do this even better if those smart chargers communicate with each other to make coordination even more 
effective. So kind of if you, if, if you would have shared information around the, the, the queue, right? How many chargers are waiting to, to charge how much you could coordinate better? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the whole key. That's why uh, the SAPTIC chargers are all interlinked in, in a cloud. So we have almost 150,000 chargers, which are now all interlinked through our cloud. They're all, uh, all uploaded. And basically, um, it doesn't mean that we can circumnavigate the owner's request. Of course, they need to uh, agree to this, but, but it's being part of a social responsible network of infrastructure. And, and by doing that, you're part of a solution and not part of a problem. Now, that's only one little part of, of what we at SAPTEC and the technology at SAPTEC we do, because the other part, which is, is just as important, is that we have IP, so intellectual property, and, and uh, on specific parts of the load management of, of, you, of, of these uh, chargers. So basically, what we can do is we, we, can, we can ensure that not only uh, can we install these chargers in a systematic way, many in a row, whereas many of the, let's say, our competition out there can maybe, let's say they go down to a parking lot, there's, there's only so and so much electricity available. Mm -hmm. and they can set up maybe four or five chargers because that's what they can do. They can install these in a line, by which time there won't be any electricity left. So there's only three or four chargers available. That's it. With, with our SAPTEC solution, we can actually install almost as many chargers as you want because we have a, a software that, in, that ensures that each charger has an available amount of electricity. So it's not like we magically can conjure up more electricity, but we can magically, <laughs> to a certain extent, uh, ensure that each car actually gets perhaps not a river of electricity, but maybe a drip. Yeah, uh, that ensures that all the vehicles will get charged within a specific time. And this is, again, very important in relation to the need or the necessity to go out and do further cabling, do further installation, which is something that really costs a lot and yeah. definitely something very expensive for uh, even first world countries, but definitely a lot more expensive for third world countries. So to be able to come up with a solution that in, on one hand can ensure a lot of chargers and on the other hand could do so without enormous in, uh, infrastructure costs is something that certainly in my opinion is a social responsible solution that helps promote electrification of yeah basically of the of the globe and thereby being part of a solution where we can reduce carbon emissions and hopefully also reduce the average temperature that uh, our planet's going into it's our, I, I see that the, the the clock is is running so I'm I'm mindful of your time I want to ask you about the market realities the kind of the you know the go to market topics first question how do you think about the different types of customers who make the choice to adopt such a charger i guess on on one hand you'd have the residential kind of you and i i can decide to put this in my home maybe in other cases you have multi user kind of big buildings with multiple families living there and then the decision is made by the building owner. So cu curious to hear your take on how do you think about the different categories of customers for your solution? So, so basically there are, as you, you quite rightly and, and very neatly described, very many elements of, of potential customers, both in the B2B uh, segment as well as the B2C segment. And you can sort of say, what, 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 what's driving them? There will be various drivers. Some will be looking at this because they can uh, reduce costs. Um, others will be more idealistic because they want to reduce their carbon footprint and others will be doing it because it's, it's, it's easier. And the last and probably the biggest part will do so because basically there are, uh, new, uh, rules. There are new legislation across many markets that are, um, promoting e-mobility and making it more difficult for internal combustion vehicles. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, Many markets uh, across uh, the Western world and, and other markets as well um, are, are actually putting a limitation and an end date 
for production and sell of, of new ICE vehicles. In Norway, it's already in 2025. In other markets, it's it's 2030. And, and some markets, it's it's later. But the, but the simple fact is that they all have an end date. And of course, if that isn't a, a good promotion to push towards e-mobility, I don't know what is. But basically, you're quite right that there are definitely different elements in here that are, and, and a lot of levers. I would say all of them push towards e-mobility. And yeah. so for us, we, we uh, Saptech, we make a, a solution and a product that fits both categories, both one for the system usage and one for, for the more private home usage. Mm. Um, of course, the one system usage has a lot more tech involved. It's called a pro and basically um, has a lot more capabilities, whereas the, the Go, which is uh, the one for the home usage, is it, still, still a smart box, still has all the uh, aforementioned parts. However, it, it's cheaper and, of course, it's, it's more aimed for, for single home use. So we try and cover basically all the aspects of this. And then we also try and ensure that we are at the very forefront of the technology. So we, we future proof everything that we do. We future proof both in relation to the quality of what we do and definitely also through the safety of what we are working with, but specifically also the tech that we, that we work with, that we, that we, as, as mentioned before, all the aspects of what we talked about is encompassed in in a new protocol called ESO 15118 right. and basically governs the this communication between the e-mobility part and the and the charger basically being trying to be compliant with that helps being part of this grander solution that I described earlier and that's what we strive towards and I as CEO of Saptic uh, push my team to strive towards to ensure that everything we do is for the better of our customers, but most definitely for the better of our um, future and for the for the planet. And just to make sure I, I completely get um, the choice that the, your customers are facing, let, let's say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a, I have a building uh, where you know I know that a number of of, of tenants have electric cars. Uh, mm. Before before I decide to go for a Zaptec uh, Pro solution. What would typically be the way that my tenants charge their car? Well, if they if they don't have anything in there, then of course they would have to go out to the uh, find some solution out there, or uh, at the at the very worst, I uh, don't know, worst or best, uh, would be with a, an extension cord with your normal two hundred and forty volt or two hundred and thirty volt, depending on where you are, yeah. um, and it would take you uh, somewhere between uh, thirty and thirty six hours to to charge a a battery of, of 50 or 60 um, kilowatt hours. Yeah. Got it. Got um, it. So, so basically that's what you would be up against. Whereas uh, if you can install a 22 kilowatt AC charger, you can do this in, in something like uh, three or four hours. And if it's 11, well, then you can double up. So it'll be, it'll be something like six hours, but that's still, as we talked about before, uh, something that that's uh, an overnight. And, and generally, you know, I say uh, it only takes about 20 seconds to, to charge the 10 seconds to plug it in and 10 seconds to plug it out again because yes. the vehicle just stands there and if and and most if private you go home do your things there. yes yeah basically unless you're a taxi driver or otherwise use your vehicle um in 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 your business um then a lot of private vehicles actually stand still for for up to 22 hours a day yeah. why not use that time in in charging so, um, you know, that the best, the best thing that I've ever encountered, I feel, um, and this is going back to the initial part of this conversation about my children and making a difference is that every now and again, when, when we're out driving and perhaps I need to put some air into my tires, you drive into a petrol station and my children will always ask me, they'll say, daddy, what is this place? They, they don't know. And that, for me, is really showing that we're making a difference, that the new generation of people, the new generation of drivers, the new generation of, 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 of carbon footprinters out there are actually being making a difference. And they don't, thankfully, know what carbon um, and, uh, and fossil fuel vehicles are.
I think Norway is is such an interesting case study, right? Because of the the like almost 10x uh, bigger adoption of electric cars in relation to the to the overall fleet c- compared to other European countries. So you can you can get a sense of where things are going by by studying that market. Maybe last question specifically on the on the kind of differences and and opportunities in other markets um for you i think you you've publicly made clear that you're looking to to expand or and already are in in other countries outside of norway what is your ambition there and how does the reality of each country differ kind of how do you have to adapt your model to yeah. to to a country when you decide to go after i don't know france germany and the likes that's a very good question and and to be quite honest uh I, I had hoped it would be easier than it is, <laughs> uh, even even within the EU, because one would have thought that uh, that uh, within the EU you would have relatively standardized um, rules and regulations. Um, that's not the case. In fact, uh, almost every single part of the uh, European nations have various regulations as to what their charges, uh, both the ones that are in the public and even the ones that are in the private, have to be able to do or not be able to do. So mm. it is quite a, a challenge to have conform product on the market within this field. So, and and initially uh, we thought that, well, we, we have made and produced a charger in Norway, which is the most EV adaptable country in the world, as you quite rightly said, actually right now, um, almost 90% of all new car sales are plug-in chargers so you know it's 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 crazy so it, it uh, again our world is most different as you quite rightly said from from the rest of the world but it's definitely something for the others to strive towards but we believe that you know working in this environment it would be easy to uh, then uh, do a blueprint and and do this in the rest of the world and or if not in just Europe but that's been quite a challenge we're we're now um, we now have six, six seven subsidiaries around uh, Europe, and I'm very happy to 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 say that we're now going full ahead uh, into the German market, into the UK market, and uh, hopefully within the first half of uh, of 23 also into the French market. But it's it hasn't been easy. I mean, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. tell you what, our technicians have been working overtime in order to ensure that we could um, be compliant with all the various different rules in each of the markets. So um, I would say they're certainly not making it easy out there to, to do adopting uh, e-mobility and, and, uh, and definitely not easier in when it comes to the infrastructure rollout. One last thing that I wanted to touch on is your, is your distribution model, um, which is mm. interesting because you've decided to take in-house some of the parts around wholesaling and, and distribution and work directly with installers. Um, which mm. is different from from others in the space. So, wh- why did you decide to go for this slightly more vertically integrated model? I guess you could say. Um, what does yeah, it What does it enable you to do? Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah, and basically, it is it is probably there's nothing stronger within sales and marketing uh, than word of mouth, and definitely if that word of mouth comes from somebody who's trusted like an electrician, mm-hmm. if you're talking about what to, to install in your house or in your parking garage, um, and specifically when it comes to something new or new technology, something that for all intensive purposes, a lot of people think is dangerous. Uh, electricity, we've always learned that, you know, you've got to be careful with your children that they don't plug anything into the uh, and at the, you know, there are definitely in the U.S. Uh, they had uh, ways of of killing people using electricity. So, so electricity is a dangerous thing put in the wrong yes. hands. Yeah. So, um, ensuring that people have a safer attitude towards uh, electricity and the and the infrastructure, we decided that that the best ambassadors for us would be those, it would be the electricians, it would be the suppliers out there whom could be showcasing what this is about and being able to show all the 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 safety features and the quality features of SAPTEC. Mm. Um, 
I mean, if you yourself was going to were going to go out and buy a charger, wouldn't you feel more comfortable if your electrician said this is something that me as a professional within this field will support and suggest that you do you put this Absolutely. as opposed to going down to the local supermarket <laughs> and buying something off the shelf and trying to put it up yourself. Yes. Um, I definitely believe that that's the right way to do it. And it's definitely what gives us a foundation of, tr- of, of, of value and, and definitely something that gives us a foundation of, of, uh, of trustworthiness in the market. Peter, we, we are, um, you know, way past the time we, we, we had given to each other. So I think we can conclude this discussion right now. Would like to ask you kind of one, one snap final question. Where do you think we will be in 10 years when it comes to, uh, you know, electrification of mobility? Wow. Uh, well, you know, if you'd asked me for 10 years ago, I, I'm not sure. Well, actually, I was sure that we were going to be where we are approximately now. Um, and 10 years from now, well, uh, we're going to have a lot more autonomy in in the uh, vehicle base. So a lot of vehicles are going to be autonomous. Um, and therefore, you're going to see a lot of autonomy also when it comes to charging. Mm-hmm. Um, now, whether that will uh, be in in sort of uh, wireless connectivity, um, convection or whatever, or whether it will be through another sort of uh, robot charging. I think we're going to see a lot of that being implemented in, in uh, over the next probably five to 10 years. Um, and we're going to see a lot more of what I discussed earlier i.e. That, that the charging of vehicles will become part of, a, of an integrated net. So you're going to see what well, I would call sort of a virtual power plants, basically, where the whole market, the whole region becomes this part of a, of a, of a, of a solution. So um, the, everything is going to be one larger solution to both the mobility side as well as the connectivity side. Um, and the infrastructure side. Um, so there's no doubt in my mind that old vehicles will be in 10 years will be electrified. You, you're not going to see any more um, ICE vehicles out there. Um, whether whether it's going to be full electric, battery electric, or whether there'll be uh, some hydrogen in there, who knows? Uh, there may be and may not. But but it will be all electrical powers, and 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 so the the pressure on the grids will be uh, quite significantly more. So we're going to see a lot of investment in this field uh, in the coming years. Peter, thank you so much. Um, we will follow the Zaptec journey. You are uh, a public company, so it's actually easier to follow you than than to follow many of your climate tech peers that that come on the show, um, and and we'll gladly do that. We'll root for you, and and um, you're always welcome to to share, you know, uh, your your progress and learnings uh, on this show in in a year time or whenever you want. Excellent. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, share some of this knowledge. Thank you, Peter. And find out more about Zaptech on their website zaptech.com. If you are inspired by their mission, check out their career page for their job openings. If you enjoyed this episode, follow us on your favorite podcast app and stay tuned for more insightful conversations with other inspiring climate tech founders.